when it comes to our mom, we don't have to worry about being canceled. They, y'all don't cancel us, do you? It's like, oh, no, you know all the bad and you know uh, the little bit of good, and it doesn't matter to you, right? You just keep loving us in the middle of it. Now, in, in the rest of our world, you know, we know a little bit of bad can negate a lifetime of good. A, a terrible moment or a terrible season can cancel out, you know, all the other good things that somebody's done, and you may not like that and say, well, that's not fair, and you're right, but life isn't fair, okay? So we just got to move on, because that's just, that's just the way it is. But man, if you moms, you demonstrate unconditional love, you demonstrate what free forgiveness looks like in such a great, great way, and I think all of us would agree, if there was some way to bottle that up, you know, the love that moms have for their kids, if there was some way to bottle that up, and export that where all of us demonstrated that to, you know, throughout the world, not just to our family, but to everybody. Oh my gosh, our, our world would be a better place. Unfortunately, that is not the reality though, is it? The reality, it looks more something like this. Uh, when it comes to people that we don't like, well, we maximize all of their mistakes. We maximize all of their wrongs. We maximize all of their sins, whatever term you want to use. When they mess up, it is no mercy, is it? It's no mercy. I'm going to, if I don't like you, I'm not cutting you any breaks. I'm not giving you the benefit of the doubt. I'm definitely not forgiving or showing unconditional love towards you. I'm just going to magnify and maximize all the mistakes you made, and you ought to get what's coming to you. And at the same time, if you're somebody I do like, then it's odd, but I'm going to turn around and minimize all your mistakes. I'm not going to be near as harsh with you because I like you, and I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt, and I'm, I'm going to pay attention to some of the good you've done, you know? So I'll just, I'll just minimize all that. And it was a moment, and it was bad, but, you know, come on, overall, you're a pretty good person. And then when it comes to us, you know, we don't even take that approach with us. When it comes to us, I'm going to justify all my own mistakes. Well, because I know what the circumstances were, and in that situation, I know what was going on, and there was a reason, and, you know, let me explain. And, you know, we tend to excuse away all of our own stuff. But this double standard, if you will, that we all live with and we all participate in, this double standard actually can create a whole lot of damage. And this double standard can lead you to a place, if you're not careful, that you actually don't want to be. So if you hadn't been with us over the last few weeks, we are wrapping up a series today called The Perfect Guide for Life. We're talking about how integrity brings clarity and it brings courage. And quick summary for you, just to get you up to speed. Integrity is one of those things that we all celebrate when we see it in other people. Uh, we criticize it when there's a lack of integrity in somebody. Anytime we see a breach of integrity, we're quick, quick to be really critical of that. Uh, we expect it of everybody. We talked about that in week one. That's a whole different conversation. It's so ironic that even if we think everybody gets to make their own choices when it comes to integrity and how we view integrity and right and wrong, well, you know, that's, we just expect that out of everybody. And then we excuse, as I said, we tend to excuse it away in ourselves, which is why we have talked throughout this series and defined integrity in such a way that sets a high bar for us because quite honestly, we need a high bar because we're always going to try to figure out a way to wiggle our way underneath whatever the bar is. But the bar is simply this, integrity is doing what you ought to even when it costs you. It's doing what you ought to even when it costs you. Because if you don't do what you ought to when it costs you, it ends up not just costing you more, but it costs the people around you. Because your irresponsibility eventually becomes somebody else's responsibility. Our integrity is personal, absolutely. It's never private. There's always a price to pay when you give your integrity away. And so we've had this theme verse or principle, if you will, that King Solomon wrote long, long time ago. It's still true today. Solomon painted a picture for us of the two different roads, the two different paths that we get to walk on, that we each get to choose, uh, that we each get to decide. But whichever road we walk on has a predictable destination to it. It always does. And so his words or his advice to us were the integrity of the upright will guide them. People who say, I'm going to make integrity my North Star, the primary decision-making filter, it always becomes the perfect guide for their life. It gives incredible clarity. But the crookedness of the treacherous, he says, people without integrity, what's well, going to destroy them eventually. That is what all of us wrestle with, isn't it? Two roads, two paths. They lead to two predictable destinations. And it would, you know, from the outside as an observer, you'd go, well, I'm always going to choose integrity. But you and I both know the reality is that's not so easy to do in the middle of real world, real life decisions. Because integrity is not the only thing vying for our attention. Our appetites, our desires, our emotions, the stuff that we want, we want it right now. Well, that's vying for our attention too. And so we're always caught 
in the tension between integrity and appetites, integrity and appetites. You were caught in it at some point this last week. You'll face that same tension again this coming week. It is just the way that it works. And so what I want to do today as we wrap this up the series is I want to talk for just a minute about how to find the courage to make the right choice to choose integrity in these situations, even if, even if it's going to cost you something, and even when it might possibly cost you everything. So we left off last week, if you weren't here, I'm, don't worry, we left off last week with a 15-year-old Jewish young man by the name of Daniel, having been uh, abducted, if you will, kidnapped, captured, whatever way you want to look at it, from his native home in Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar had showed up, the Babylonian emperor, after the battle of Carchemish, when he defeated all the um, the Assyrians and the Egyptians, he marches to Jerusalem. He defeats the, the Israelites. He takes the best and the brightest of the young men, which included Daniel. He marches them off to Babylon to serve in his government, and he's going to put them in a three-year training program. And we looked last week at what this program entailed, and Daniel makes the oddest decision in the middle of this. Daniel decides something that seems like nothing to us is actually everything to him. He's going to draw a line there. He's not going to violate his integrity. He's going to take the risk of losing his life over the kind of food he was going to eat in this program. We talked all about that last week, if you want to go back and catch up on that. And Daniel, because of his integrity, along with three of his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these four guys end up uh, being honored for the integrity that they have. They're allowed to eat a different kind of food at the end of three years. They stand before Nebuchadnezzar, and where we left off was Nebuchadnezzar giving them a final exam. He finds them better than all the other young men who went through the program. He gives them prominent positions in his government, and it seems like it's a happily ever after ending. Only if you know much of Daniel's story and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know it was not. It was one test of integrity after another their entire lives. And I'm not going to go into all of that, but one of the things that's interesting, and to give you some context of what we're going to talk about today... Daniel ends up serving over the course of his life from the time he's 15 until his early 80s. Daniel ends up serving four different kings in three different kingdoms. So, you know, he served Nebuchadnezzar, and then he served under Nebuchadnezzar's son, Belshazzar. So they were both part of the Babylonian Empire. And then the Medes came in, defeated the Babylonians, and Daniel served under Darius. And then after Darius, the Persians came in and defeated the Medes and kind of assimilated all of that together. And he served under somebody, maybe you've heard about if you're a history buff, Cyrus the Great. So Daniel ends up serving under all four of these kings over the course of a long, long political career. But today, for the purposes of our discussion, I want us to revisit something that happens to Daniel 55 years after he was first deported to Babylon. So he's about 70 years old at this point, and he's serving under the reign of King Darius. And Darius decides he needs to reorganize his entire government. This is what prompted it all. The empire's gotten bigger and bigger and expanded and expanded. He feels like he needs a new structure. And so what he does is he divides his entire empire into 120 different provinces. You could think of them like states, okay? He divides them into 120 different states. And then he puts satraps, or what we would call governors, over each of the 120 provinces. And then he decides he's going to name three administrators who are going to govern or oversee all 120 of these governors or satraps. Daniel is one of the three men that he chooses to be an administrator. And all of that seems to go really well for a little while until Daniel um, outpaces the other administrators and excels in such a way these clearly head and shoulders above the rest. And Darius gets an idea. Darius goes, you know what? I think I want to create a new position. I want to make Daniel, I want to elevate him to be prime minister of my entire empire. And then I'll fill his role with somebody else. And so these three administrators will answer to Daniel, you know, and then all the governors will answer to the administrators, which sounds like a great plan with the exception of, you know, how politics work, right? So, yeah. So they're all furious when they hear this because they don't want somebody else getting this power and this position that they wish they had. And so the governors and the administrators, they're filled with anger, full of jealousy, and they hatch a plan to try to disrupt and derail Daniel's promotion. And here's what the writer tells us happens. He says that this, the administrators and the satraps of the governors, they tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs. So their approach is this. 
All we've got to do is find some corruption in Daniel's past. It'll disqualify him. We'll prove to Darius he's not as trustworthy as he looks. And then one of us will get the job. Now, what do you think they found? Well, if he's a typical politician, they found about a thousand page report of corruption, right? It's like anytime they run one of those things, I don't care if it's Republican or Democrat. It's like, oh my gosh, like how can you be in politics without, you know? So there's, you just assume, oh yeah. Now think about this. 55 years in public political service under at this point two different empires three different kings and somehow he's managed to stay at the top somehow he's managed to keep this power how do you think he kept this power we know how a normal politician would manage to keep that power but after all their research they had access to all the records after all their research after all their investigation the writer tells us and they were unable to do so it's unbelievable isn't it it's like 55 years and you couldn't go back and find any wrongdoings. You couldn't even find anything you could twist into making it look like he'd done something wrong. They go, no, no. Writer goes on to say they could find no corruption in him because Daniel was trustworthy. He wasn't corrupt nor negligent, which tells us something. We don't know a lot about what went on between 15 and 70, but this tells us that the decisions he made to maintain his integrity at 15 were decisions that he continued to make for the next 55 years. And so, these guys realize, we can't dig up any dirt on this man. We've got to find another way to depose him and to derail the plans. So here's what they do. The writer tells us that the men said, we'll never find any basis for charges against this man Daniel unless it has something to do with the law of his God. They said, we have got to figure out a way to get Daniel caught where he has to choose between his government and his God. Because at 55 years of history told them he's going to choose his God every single time. And so they hatch a plan. This is actually a pretty ingenious plan. They go to King Darius one day and they say, Darius, we've just been thinking. Now, anytime you've got somebody comes to you and starts like that, you know, uh uh-oh, right? We've been thinking, you are the greatest king in the history of the world. And the buttering starts. You know, it's like, here we go. So they say, we've been reflecting on what an amazing king you are. I mean, you're so great. You're like a god. You're like a god. You're just nobody. The world's never seen a king like you. So we, we've got an idea. We think we should host a 30 days of Darius celebration throughout the entire empire. It's going to be amazing. We're going to get t-shirts, little Darius bobbleheads, Darius dogs. I mean, the merch is going to fly off the shed. It's going to be incredible, you know. And of course, he's stroke, they're stroking the ego of this guy. This guy's like, this sounds like a great idea to me, you know. He's not paying attention to the long game. So they're like, we're, we're going to throw this. You like this? We'll do a parade, you know, through town. We'll have you, you know. He's like, oh, yeah, that sounds pretty good. So they get all of these plans laid out. They said, Darius, we, we want you to prove this. Oh, by the way, you're so amazing. Here's what we're thinking. We, we think for 30 days, everybody in the empire ought to have to pray to you because that, they, that's how they show that they honor you. That's how they show they're loyal to you. That's how they show that they recognize you're basically like a god. You're so amazing. So let's just, let's just outlaw and ban any prayer to any god but you for 30 days. Now, we don't have time to talk about this, but how narcissistic do you have to be to say, I think everybody ought to pray to me for 30 days, you know? It's like, I'd be committed somewhere if I got up here and said that. But Darius goes for it. He's like, oh, I love this. I love this. And then they throw this in. They're like, you know what? We're going to have the parade, and we're going to have all the merch, and we're going to have all the stuff going. Darius, we might even throw in a few public executions. Does that sound fun to you? He's like, oh, yeah. He's like, yeah, yeah. If anybody doesn't pray to you, if they pray to some other god instead, we're just going to have them thrown in a lion's den. It'll be great entertainment, them versus the lions. Darius signs off on it, okay? Again, Quite a bit of narcissism. He signs off on it. And they've set the trap. Darius doesn't know it, but they have set the trap for Daniel. And so, word starts to get out, you know. The declaration is made. And the writer tells us that when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Now, just pause right here for a second. What would you do at this point if you were Daniel? I'm going to be honest. I think, number one, I'm going to close my windows. I think that's where I would start. No need for those windows to be open. Um, number two, I can, I can pray to God without you knowing I'm praying to God. I just do it in my head. 
You know, no need to kneel down at the windows, which is what he usually did. Let me just close the windows, clean the house, and pray while I'm cleaning. Nobody will ever know. Daniel's got a lot of options here. Now, before we move on, there's a question I think is important for you to wrestle with, and you may not know the answer today, but I think it's worth you spending some time thinking about over the next few days and trying to figure it out because this will explain a lot of the decisions you make and it will explain the reason you have ended up in a lot of the places, good or bad, that you have ended up. The question is, what do you do when you're certain that the right thing will cost you? Well, it depends on what's most important to you. That's what determines what you do. Your marriage is struggling, and you want to get out, why would you be miserable the rest of your life? What do you do when you think, well, the only way, the only, the only way for this marriage to survive is for me to go through some things that are going to cost me a lot, and there's no guarantee it's going to be better. What if I'm miserable forever? I'm going to have to go through counsel, and I'm going to have to do that. We're going to have to put so much work into this. What do you do when you're in that situation? It depends on what's most important to you. It depends on whether your marriage and your commitment and your integrity to that person is most important or your happiness is most important. What do you do when you find yourself in a situation where if you lie, it'll benefit you in some way? And it doesn't even have to be a big lie. It's just a little deception, but it'll pay off. It's a little deception. It'll keep you out of trouble. It's a little deception and your boss will never know. That depends on what's most important to you. Controlling the outcome and feeling like you were able to get what you wanted there or... Your integrity. What do you do when you got this financial opportunity, but uh, it's going to force you to violate your integrity a little bit, but it's going to make you a lot of money. Depends on what's most important to you. This is true for all of us. When it comes down to it, when we're certain a decision, maintaining our integrity is going to cost us something, what we do in that moment depends on whether there is anything in our life that is more important to us than our integrity. And listen, I'm not trying to be hard here, but the reality is anytime you and I choose something other than our integrity, it just shows that thing is way more important. It doesn't matter what we've said. That thing is actually more important than our integrity, than doing what we say we know we ought to. This is what Daniel's wrestling with. As he goes back home, he walks upstairs there are those open windows where three times a day, because he was Jewish and this was a part of their culture and part of their life, three times a day he would kneel at those windows, face Jerusalem, and pray to his God. What's he going to do? Well, you may know the story. Here's what he did. Three times a day, after the decree, he still got on his knees, he still prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. No change. No change. Which, if we're honest, seems a little extreme, doesn't it? It's like, no, you, there are other ways to do this, Daniel. But Daniel was not going to allow any breach of his integrity because he knew one breach leads to another and another leads to a pattern. And so he just kept praying. He just kept praying. To which, if we'd have been there, I think we'd have said, why are you doing this? And I think he would have said, well, because I think my God is bigger than any threat. And I value my relationship with him more than controlling the outcome of this situation. And so we prayed. Just like, just like all these guys thought he was going to do when they set up 30 days of Darius. So they were set up across the street. Camera, telephoto lens, they were capturing it all, right? They knew he was going to keep his windows open. They're snapping pictures, snapping pictures, getting proof, getting proof. They run back to Darius. You can read this for yourself in Daniel 6. They run back to Darius. They say, hey, we're in the middle of 30 days of Darius. How's it going? Oh, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. How are all those prayers coming? I don't know. I'm not trying to answer any, but boy, it's nice to hear them talking about my name, you know? So he's like, all right, all right, hey, we got one little problem here. And they just hand the picture, you know? Daniel, oh, you know... Man, we're heartbroken too, Darius. I mean, he was about to get promotion. It's terrible. It's terrible. But, but Daniel clearly is not as loyal to you as you thought he was. And when Darius finds out about this, he is so distraught. Because you know this. How, how valuable do you think a person is in government who you never have to wonder if they're going to stab you in the back? 
How valuable do you think a trustworthy number two man is for the king of the Medes and the Persians? Really valuable. And now Darius knows he's stuck. He calls his lawyers in, tries every way to figure out. But in, in their culture and in their world, when a king issued a law, it was unchangeable and irreversible. And so the lawyers are like, there is no loophole. You can't save him. Darius, you, you got to go through with the consequences to Daniel. So they send and have Daniel arrested. They bring him, get the pit with the lions already, you know, let him go two or three days without eating. They've got all this ready. And just before they throw Daniel in, King Darius. Now, King Darius is not someone who believes in Daniel's God at this point. But King Darius leans over to Daniel and he whispers in his ear, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. May the God, Daniel, that you are clearly more devoted to than your own life. I don't know what he's like, but I'm hoping that somehow a miracle happens and he rescues you from that pit. And then they lower Daniel in and Darius goes home. You can read this for yourself. He spends all night in the palace, distraught, anguished, up all night upset, spends all night thinking about what's going to happen. It finally clicks with him. <laughs> 30 days of Darius, I was a fool. This is what this whole thing was about. He finally connects all the dots, you know. And the next morning, the writer tells us at the first light of dawn, the king got up and he hurried to the lion's den. Again, you can see just how valuable Daniel is to him. He hurries to the lion's den. And the writer goes on saying when he came near the den, he, he called to Daniel. I wish it, this would have been fascinating to watch, right? It's like, you, king, you actually... You actually think there's a chance he's going to respond, you know? He calls to Daniel in anguished voice, and he says, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? And I'm sure everybody around there is looking around kind of like, it's going to be awkward. It's going to be a lot of silence. And he hears a voice from the pit that says, I'm hungry. You got any breakfast? No, that's not what Daniel said. <laughs> Listen, you probably know the end of the story. If you don't know the end of the story, I hate to spoil it for you, but God did rescue Daniel. He's not dead. But I don't even want to talk about that. And if you have a hard time believing that, that's okay. Because that is not the win here. The win is not the end of the story. The point of this story is not the end, the outcome of this story. Daniel, think about this. Daniel's primary concern was not the outcome of the story. If it had been, he would have made different choices, closed those windows, and prayed while he was fixing dinner. He wasn't worried about the outcome of the story, which sounds so irrational and irresponsible, doesn't it? But Daniel won before he knew the outcome. Daniel won because he made the right choice in terms of what was most important. Daniel won because he decided my integrity, which has a direct impact on my relationship with God and my relationship with people, because trust is the foundation for any healthy relationship, my integrity is most important to me, and I'm going to guard that, and if it gets me killed, it gets me killed. If I get rescued by God, I get rescued, but either way, I'm walking out with my integrity. So Daniel won before the outcome ever played out. Now, the reason I bring this up is because here's the question I want to leave you with today. What's your win? In other words, what's most important to you? What do you actually value the most? Now, if you're not a follower of Jesus, okay, you figure this out, and there are a lot of different answers. You can come up with whichever one you want. I, I just want to pick on us Christians for a minute because we're in church, and we would all say, oh, I value God the most. You know, I want to obey him. I want to follow him. I don't know. If, if we only as Christians maintain our integrity when we think it's a means to a happily ever after win, a happily ever after outcome, a happily ever after end, listen, we're not actually followers of Jesus anymore. We're just consumers of Jesus. 
I'm going to do what God asked me to do and kind of follow it because I think it's going to work out best for me. But the minute I, I'm pretty sure the outcome's not going to be best for me, then I'm going to throw that out the window. We just become consumers. And a lot of us, that's all we've done is we've just, we're just consumers. We choose it when it's helpful. We dispose of it when it's not. When you find yourself in a situation where you are certain doing the right thing is going to cost you something and you feel like it might cost you everything, that's when you find out if your faith, if your relationship with God is disposable to you or not. For Daniel, it clearly wasn't. But the point of the story and the thing I want you to walk away with today is not, oh, if you'll maintain your integrity, God will honor you and make sure everything works out great. He does not promise that and it may not happen. The point of the story is, what's most important to you? Will you value integrity and in your relationship with God and others more than you value any other outcome that you're hoping for, wishing for, or pleading for in your life? So I want to end with another principle from King Solomon. And I would encourage you, just like I have the other one, this one would be worth memorizing. This is one I memorized um, a long time ago to remind me of why integrity matters so much. In Proverbs 28, 1, Solomon said, the wicked flee, though no one pursues. You know why? Because they have a guilty conscience. Because they always assume other people are going to do to them what they would do to other people. They don't trust anybody because they assume everybody's out to get them. They assume eventually all the stuff from the past is going to catch up to them. So the wicked people flee. People without integrity, they flee even though nobody's pursuing them. But the righteous, people of integrity, are as bold as a lion. You know why? Because their win is what I actually think you want your win to be. Their win is a clear conscience. Every night when they lay their head on their pillow at night, no matter what it costs them, they know I did what I ought to do. Their win is confidence. Confidence they've got nothing to hide. Confidence God is with them. Confidence that God is for them. Confidence that God is going to show up and walk with them through whatever they're walking through because they have maintained their integrity with God as well as maintained their integrity with others. So they're bold as a lion. They're courageous. They're willing to make choices and do things and handle situations in ways nobody else will. Because they're not afraid of what's coming their way. Integrity does that for you. Integrity gives you courage. Integrity makes you bold as a lion. So, you have to decide what your win is. You have to decide what matters most to you. You have to decide what you're going to value. But listen, whatever you choose to value will determine where you end up and what you end up doing and the kind of person you end up becoming. So I would suggest that you make choices that will give you a clear conscience and give you confidence that you do what you ought to, even when it's going to cost you. Because in the long run, it is always, always, always what's best for you and best for me too. Let me pray for us. Father, in this moment, would you help us to be willing to decide in advance as Daniel did? This is what I'm going to value most. I'm going to value my integrity. I'm going to value the trust I have in my relationship with God and the trust I have in my relationship with people. I'm not going to make any decision that could in any way diminish or destroy that. Help us to be people who are willing, especially those of us who follow you. Help us to be people who are willing to, to just follow the example you set for us, Jesus, to do what we ought to, even if it's going to cost us everything. And to leave the outcome in your hands, that's up to you. And just to value what matters most with you. Thank you, Jesus, for the strength you give us to do that, the encouragement you give us, and thanks for the boldness that we get to experience when we are people of integrity. Would you continue to allow integrity to guide us and to help us 
to listen carefully to your direction, to your voice, to your standard, to submit to it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.